Good morning, everybody. Uh, one of the things about uh, going last is you end up with tough acts to follow. Um, but I guess the good thing about a breakfast meeting is at least I'm not between you and an open bar, right? <laughs> so uh, um, hopefully you have enough energy still to, uh, from a great breakfast uh, to uh, listen to our story. And I say our story, story because I want to start by uh, acknowledging some of my teammates uh, who uh, made the trip down here, because this is as much their story, if not more, than it is mine uh, that I want to tell. Um, and I got to start maybe 15 years ago, but I'll fast forward uh, along the lines. Um, and it was before Superior, before I joined Superior, uh, I had uh, the chairman of the board of the company that I was working for come into my office and say, uh, congratulations. I'm promoting you to the loneliest job in the company. And with that, I became the president of a business. And it took me aback for a moment uh, to, to have that thought. And it then occurred to me, wait a minute, I like going to lunch and talking about how I would do things if I was in charge. And I like going home and telling my wife what I would do if I was in charge. Uh, but as I got into the role, I realized, you know, I'm really not alone because this was up in Northeast Pennsylvania, and I had already started working with the Industrial Resource Center up there several years earlier through a CEO forum. So I already had people that I could talk with, people I could rely on, and people that I could commiserate with on different things. So when I came down to, uh, down and back for me to Collegeville at the end of 05, um, and began the privilege of, of leading Superior Tube. One of my first calls was to the Delaware Valley IRC, and uh, Jeff Gosner and I, um, well, we, we go to Collegeville Diner pretty often, uh, often enough that the uh, waitress uh, knows what we want for breakfast. So two, three times a year or so, we get together. And a concept for these last six years has been whatever our business challenge has been. Uh, I've had a sounding board. I've been able to bounce ideas and get access to resources for various things. So when I was asked to uh, share a little bit about our story today, I was very glad to be able to do so. A little bit about my sponsor. Um, when I got there, uh, I'd say Superior was a 70-year-old 70 70 year old company. And I'd like to think today that we're a 77-year young company as we've tried to rekindle the entrepreneurial spirit that made it awesome in its day. So it went through a number of uh, logos in the time. We, one thing that is constant is we, we make highly engineered, small diameter specialty metal tubing. Um, and, and we've got a reputation in the industry that's second to none. Been involved in things on the edge of aerospace, uh, on the edge of, at the, back in the day, radio and television for tubes. Uh, and more recently, uh, very big in energy and also in medical applications. And you're going to see a few pictures through this. And yes, we've been to the moon uh, and, and have product out in space, quite a bit of it, as well as under, underwater in our nuclear submarine program. In the world of medical, uh, probably uh, the most exciting thing we're doing right now is uh, providing the tubing that is uh, enabling uh, heart valve replacement projects that enable uh, potentially at someday the end of the zipper club, the idea of cracking a chest open. Uh, the science can now deliver a heart valve uh, through, the, through the arteries and it's coming from our tubing. We're also in energy in a big way in various aspects of, of nuclear and, and other energy applications. Um, and as I indicated, we're also big in the defense program, both uh, in the air and on the ground and in the, in the water. And we do this out of one location where we've been uh, since 1934 in Collegeville, PA. Um, we were about 200 employees. We're proud to now be back up around 250. We've hired 40 people in the last year. So 30s to 50s, place minted money did really well. Uh, 60s and 70s, it's lost its way. Uh, by the early 2000s, uh, something had to give. And ownership, which was private and family from the beginning, um, for totally independent reasons, as they moved from third generation to fourth, 
decided that they wanted to exit from direct control of operating businesses. So the challenge when I got there uh, was uh, we've got to fix it to sell it uh, or we're going to have to close it because one way or another uh, we were moving on with things. Um, not to be over dramatic about it, but it was about saving the company, saving employees' jobs, and turning us into something that was viable and would be attractive in the marketplace. That's an example of, uh, so there's a finger and there's a, kind of the size of some of what we do. In that case, we're talking about uh, uh, arterial stents. So, all right, here's one that I think very, is very strong in any manufacturing business. Regardless of what you're making, regardless of how much raw material, technology, and other components make up your mix, it is ultimately a matter of process control and employee involvement. No matter how automated you are, there's still a heck of a lot of human element involved in anything that you do and the decisions get, that get made. So constantly, you're trying to achieve a better level and a stronger level of more process control and control over more processes. And getting employee involvement to achieve that becomes a key in the deal. Much of what we've talked with DVIRC about has been along those lines. We did have, uh, historically, very difficult labor management relations, which you can imagine pretty much uh, preclude the ability to have good employee involvement to enable the process control that you want for the operation. So we've worked very hard in that arena in order to get us to a position, and truly one of the key parts of that was to be, to, to be transparent, to be open, to be honest, to talk about the current reality, to talk about our fears and our wishes, and to try to get people to buy in and, and share that, that same vision that we had. So we use something called interest-based bargaining uh, in, a, in our labor negotiations with the steel workers. Um, it was a non-DVRC event, uh, but it was then definitely uh, related to how we were then able to work with different things on lean because it involved a consensus approach towards solving what had traditionally been uh, more, more uh, difficult kinds of conversations. With that, we were then working with DVRC. We got into a number of different packages. And I'm going to touch on about five or six different things briefly that we've done with DVRC. Six Sigma training and various projects associated with that. It says here that we have four that have achieved the green belt. I'm talking with Manny this morning. He's also working with a quality engineer and she's making tremendous progress towards her green belt at this point. It's been a key part of what we've done in terms of getting another level of uh, knowledge and tools applied to some of the tougher projects that we have at work. In a broader sense, though, we've also gone very heavily into lean. From the initial labor negotiations in 06, where we changed a lot of what needed to be done in order to have a, an effective workplace, when we negotiated in 2010, what labor and management decided to do was to actually put a joint commitment to lean into our collective bargaining agreement, which essentially makes it something that's set now as an expectation of all employees to participate in the continuous improvement process. With DVRC, we also uh, had a, uh, from the same effort, uh, an operational excellence team formed. It was part-time. One of their initial efforts was to go out and benchmark. And DVRC was instrumental in getting us access to a number of, of operations so that we could get exposed to ideas outside of what we were doing and fuel some energy into how we were going to pursue our lean journey. Flip the switch over to the marketing side of things. Uh, with Mark and with Chris, a few years back, we had very outdated brochures. We modernized them. Um, it really just gives us a nice little leave behind on customer visits. We tailored one for each one of our major market segments. Um, and we've also used them internally uh, in training and in uh, onboarding new employees. And it didn't cost a heck of a lot of money either. Export assistance was mentioned earlier. Um, this is an area that we've become involved with over the last couple of months and uh, attended the last couple of work sessions. 
We're getting excited, we're getting some good ideas, and we're starting to see some ways that we can expand our business uh, internationally. CEO Forum. Uh, this might have been where my initial um, involvement with the IRCs occurred some 20 years ago. So uh, a couple of years ago when uh, we had hired a, a bright young talent who's in the room so I won't say that much more about him, uh, onto our team. Um, and I knew that there was a CEO for him in the Delaware Valley area. Uh, pretty much it was my idea for him to join the team and, and go through that for him. But after the first year, it became his idea to stay with it because of the value that a CEO forum uh, brings to, uh, to individuals as they're developing. So one of the results and one of the things that we've learned is that you are swimming upstream as you're looking to change cultures and as you're looking to implement change. But at some point, you start to get some momentum and start to get some wind behind your sails. And, and we've reached that point in what we're doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the results. Um, when I got there, the 20 previous years made some money some years, lost some money some years. You added it all up, it was a net zero. So a key part of what we had to do was achieve a way of consistent profitability in order to be attractive to the marketplace. Happy to report that this will be our fifth consecutive profitable year and the best six year stretch in about 30 years for the business. Uh, which really does position us for that exit strategy which was coming one way or another. Um, so we're in pretty good shape there. As I mentioned, we hired 40 people this uh, year. We're awfully proud of that. Um, it, it's certainly in this economy something that, that is not the norm. Uh, it gives all of our employees a lot of uh, confidence in what we've been doing and shows a tangible result from it and establishes a lot of pride that goes back into that entrepreneurial spirit. Relative to some of the projects that we've done, I'm not gonna rattle them all off, but every single one of them had a meaningful, measurable impact on the business. 50,000 here, 100,000 there. Next thing you know, you're talking about some real money, right? Um, and as we move forward, in the next couple of years, and we've done this all on a voluntary basis. Um, the involvement at this point, we're past uh, 60 to 70 percent participating in Kaizen events, uh, in training sessions, and, and more than half of that is union employees uh, participating along those lines. And uh, we fully expect to get to the 100 percent involvement over the next two years or so. Lessons learned. It, it's a journey. It, you never end. Um, and there's going to be challenges and people aren't going to jump on board right away. Uh, but you got to stick with it and you have to communicate a heck of a lot constantly uh, at all different levels and in all different kinds of formats. We have put a full-time Kaizen promotion office in place to have the resources that are dedicated there for coaching, for supporting, for reinforcing, for following up on the activities that we do. And then I'm going to finish with a couple slides of uh, a little bit more broader lessons learned, I'd say. Um, and this is one, many things that we learn, we learn early in life. Uh, so I remember very fondly growing up, playing baseball, and my father saying, you know, you, you can't get a hit if you don't swing the bat. And, and that was his generous way of saying, stop standing up there and, and, and taking strike three. But, but it is true. You have to swing. And that is true about business. It's true about anything that you want to do. Um, it's up to you to take the steps to move forward with it. And when you're talking about change and you're talking about doing things that, uh, that, that are not in people's comfort zones, uh, it's important to have persistence. And I think the other P word that goes with that is some patience to go with it as well. And the last one that I want to mention here is the idea of triangulation. Whether it's a real word or not, I've used it a long time. Um, you know, you go into uncharted territories where you can't look to page 42 and see what the answer might be. Uh, so what I have found useful is to try to find, if possible, three different ways to look at the situation and three different perspectives to see what's the best thing that you can do. And, uh, through that process, hopefully make more good decisions than not so good ones. 
And I do believe that Jim Coos and I think it's Barry Posner from Harvard had it right in the mid-90s. Uh, and this is kind of something that I don't do this every morning when I brush my teeth, but pretty often I try to ask myself, of these leadership practices, am I challenging the status quo? Am I inspiring a shared vision? Do I model the way? Do I enable others to act? And do I encourage the heart? And uh, I believe that that's all of our responsibilities. And when we come out here to not only um, support uh, DVRC and their efforts and uh, in the holiday season to make the Christmas a little bit brighter for some people, uh, I know it's also taking time out of our days and adding to our day. Uh, so we're actually practicing these when we come out. So I appreciate that. Last thing for me for uh, Superior 2, where are we at? Uh, well, we are transitioning ownership right now. It's a very exciting time for us. Um, in fact, um, entertaining, or we are as a team, uh, both strategic and financial uh, buyers, uh, as we speak, two or three a week, a lot of dinners, a lot of planned tours, a lot of discussions. Um, so sometime within the next couple months, we will have succeeded in step one of, of our journey uh, relative to, to exiting with the current ownership, and we're very excited about step two, which is a new relationship with a new owner. And we know two things that will be a critical part of that is we'll continue with a lean journey. Uh, and our challenge will be to internalize it so that it's not something we do separate, but it's something that we do naturally and it's the way that we think all day, every day. And ultimately, it, it all has to be about meaningful growth because with, without growth, uh, the opposite occurs. Um, and, and meaningful, we say that not, I, I differentiate it from profitable because it's much more than that. Uh, meaningful growth, in my mind, has to uh, meet the constituents of uh, customers, stockholders, employees, and, and all other related factions. So that's where we're up to. Thank you very much for your time.